Okay, well, th thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this, uh, this really nice um, webinar. So I'm going to describe uh, some recent computational modelling on multi-component alloy phases uh, in terms of their interacting electrons and nuclei. Um, before I start, I must acknowledge my co-author, it's uh, Chris Woodgate, as shown on the slide, whose PhD work um, in the HETSIS Centre for Doctoral Training here at Warwick produced many of the results and insights that I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, I'll just outline the talk. So I'll start with some contextual remarks about alloy phases, and I'll refer primarily um, to binary alloys uh, in, in, this, in this context, and I'll specify in particular um, solid solutions and also um, that form at relatively high temperatures and then the ordered inter intermetallics that can occur lower, lower, at lower temperatures. Um, I'll then um, discuss the, some of the factors that arise in, in those binary systems and how they are reflected in multi-component alloys. In particular, I'll touch on the high entropy alloys and I'll, I'll say a bit more about what they are. Um, these multi-component systems, they present um, quite signif significant challenges for modelling, especially modelling ab initio, so from the sub-nano scale. And I'll describe um, our new computationally relatively inexpensive approach for doing this and illustrate it with some applications uh, that we've carried out. Uh, and these will be to the refractory high entropy alloys. Um, so start on my opening remarks on uh, alloy phases. So as I said, I'm going to just discuss this topic just in terms of binary uh, components uh, and then um, sort of high um, point to the, the factors that we have to consider for these more complex higher um, multi-component systems. So the first thing we want to consider is um, given two elements, can they mix together? Um, if they do, uh, do they form ordered phases at low, low temperatures or do they ultimately phase segregate? So on the right there, there's the um, schematic of a phase diagram of the copper gold system. Copper and gold, they mix quite happily together. Uh, and then below the melting point, they form a, a solid solution. And this solid solution has an underlying face centered cubic lattice. And then you can consider the gold and copper atoms randomly occupying these sites in this FCC lattice. When that solid solution phase is cooled down still further, then the relatively famous uh, copper three gold structure ordered alloy can arise depending on the stoichiometry of the, of the solid solution or the copper gold phase uh, with a different pattern and, and so forth. So the, those are the intermetallic um, alloys of considering. If you looked at uh, mixing copper and nickel, they those two metals mix again very well below uh, from the below the melting point. Uh, again, they they the alloy forms um, a, a face centered cubic lattice, and again the copper and the nickel randomly occupy the sites in that FCC lattice. But then, if you were to cool that down still further, then at some temperature they would the two metals would face segregate and they separate out. So that's the sorts of questions we now want to ask for these um, multi-component um, alloys. So three, four, five plus elements mixed together. Which, which can mix? Are there solid solution phases that are stable down to low temperatures? Uh, are there some ordered phases that can arise? And obviously, primarily, do they have uh, useful properties that we can um, exploit in applications? So here's a schematic of what I've been talking about. So the solid solution is shown in the diagram on the uh, on the right. So again, some clearly uh, a clear lattice formate, forming, but the uh, different atoms uh, are just randomly occupying the sites. And then the lower temperature, a, pos a possible lower temperature phase is shown on the left there, where the, the atoms have ordered into uh, some appropriate pattern. And it's the type, the different ordering patterns that occur that affect the mechanical, electrical, thermal properties, et cetera. And of course, steels and all sorts of alloys are very, uh, are very much affected in this way. So for the sub, sub nano scale, we want to develop some modeling that can um, help um, discover new phases or understand the stability of phases and so forth. And um, density functional theories, 
obviously a very widely used technique for this sort of modeling at this length scale is a very good approach for predicting stable alloy phases, the way it um, calculates energies and can see which is the lowest energy, which phase is most stable at high temperatures, uh, at low temperatures. And then by analyzing those energies, you can uh, then um, extract out parameters for further atomistic modeling. So as the little diagram on the bottom of the slide shows um, a kind of atom-atom uh, interchange parameters uh, that you could extract out from these energy calculations, which you could then feed into some lattice-based uh, atomistic simulation. So the interest now is to see if we can set up something um, feasible for these multi-component systems. Way. No, can't take it that way. Okay, and so I'm going to um, illustrate this with uh, remarks on high entropy alloys. So these are alloys of three, four plus elements, and the the thing about them is that the elements are mixed together in roughly equal proportions, and so this leads to the entropy of mixing being a, a, a really significant component of the free energy, uh, hence the the name. And uh, that enables that if they, the appropriate elements do mix together, then they can form these solid solution phases, potentially down to quite low temperatures, or they'll, fill, they'll, they'll, fall, they'll form these uh, solid solution phases. And then at lower temperatures, some interesting um, ordered intermetallic phase might arise. And clearly, it, uh, the, the scope for searching amongst um, uh, the possible combinations can lead to some uh, very desirable and tunable physical properties. Um, so in the bottom part of this slide, I'm just uh, giving some examples. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see uh, a figure I've, um, I've borrowed from uh, this uh, paper listed at the bottom, which is showing the various classes of the currently examined high entropy alloys. So in red, um, so the, these are the 3D transition metal high entropy alloys. These are the cancer Wu alloys. So iron, nickel, cobalt, manganese, titanium, and chromium. Um, I think it's been under uh, study for some, something like uh, 20, 20 years or so now. Um, and then there's they form typically face-centered cubic solid solutions and remain stable down to pretty low temperatures. Then there's the refractory high entropy alloys, um, which uh, might be of particular interest to, to this webinar, I think. Uh, these elements, again, shown in blue here on the, on the periodic table plot, so zirconium, niobium, moly, tungsten, etc. They typically, they do mix, and typically they form um, body-centered cubic solid solutions. And then there's the, the low-density uh, hexagonal close-packed alloys of, of the light uh, light elements, and there's the lanthanide uh, um, hexagonal high entropy alloys uh, as well. And then the variety of ordered phases that can occur at uh, lower temperatures. There's a vast, so there's a vast space of possibilities to explore. And I have to say, at the moment, I think a relatively small number of um, high entropy alloys have been discovered, and perhaps um, are still. Um, Quite, quite a lot of um, um, study. So that's what a high entropy alloy is. Oops. Okay, so it, it, clearly, given the, the numbers of um, elements that are um, around, the number of possible arrangements, the modeling uh, challenges are quite significant, especially if you're trying to do this from a kind of bottom level up. So you're looking in terms of modeling in terms by uh, seeing how the electrons behave with all, and, and the nuclei. So we've got septillions of electrons in principle interacting with many, many nuclei. The usual approach uh, in this length scale is to make use of the fact that the nuclei are slowly moving in comparison to the electrons. So you typically would imagine freezing those nuclear positions and then solving the electronic problem. And then you investigate how this complex electron fluid glues the nuclei together. And then what density functional theory will do will produce an energy, internal energy of the material for that proposed um, arrangement of nuclei, along with its dependence on the electronic density. And then you want to investigate the minima of, these, of this energy to find out the stable arrangements of the atoms. 
So you can apply this approach to, to our alloys to see what alloys are stable. But there's a, a computational cost if you want to investigate these multi-component alloys, simply because you would have to set up a density functional uh, setup. Let's say you, you use some supercell, and then to model an alloy, you've got to uh, run over many different configurations of these three, four, five possible uh, uh, choices of, of atom species. So it can be very expensive to explore that space uh, adequately. Can build um, interatomic potentials in machine learning from the DFT data, but the, the number of components means that uh, the amount of DFT training data you need is rather large. So what I'm going to describe is um, a fast method. It's more approximate, but it is a fast way of averaging over the disorder in the high temperature solid solution phase. So we start with um, an effective way of describing this high temperature uh, phase. Once we've done that, we then um, rigorously set up a, a theory and a computational method to describe the um, atom, the atomic short range order that could arise in this solid solution phase as it's being cooled um, towards a possible transition temperature. That can be, in principle, can be um, compared with uh, diffuse uh, scattering experiments. Um, uh, and also we could look at where the uh, short range order then uh, ultimately spreads to becoming a long range order throughout the system to figure out what potential ordered phases might arise. But this quantity can also give us information from where we, where we can extract some parameters to build our at, uh, lattice-based atomistic models to then make a further study of the high entropy alloy um, phase diagrams, et cetera. And emphasize it, it, this approach, obviously it, ha it has its approximations, but it's much cheaper and, and faster than the regular um, DFT um, supercell approach. Okay, so just a little bit more about uh, what goes in. I don't, keeping to the limits of the time. So what I've indicated is, is that we have a, a, an approach where we can evaluate the internal energy of the fully disordered alloy based on density functional theory, but we're using an effective medium approach to describe the averaging over the atomic configurations. It's called the coherent potential approximation, and it's an old um, uh, method uh, for, for binary alloys, but now it's really coming into its own, we, we reckon, for these multi-component systems. So what it does is it sets up some effective potential that you place on every site in, in the lattice, such that the motion of an electron through that effective lattice mimics very well the motion of an electron on the average through the disordered alloy. So with that description, we then take the next step and then look at the cost in energy terms of a small modulation of the composition. So a small disruption of the uniform um, um, uh, homogeneous um, uh, concentration profile through the solid solution. And we represent this uh, in terms of, um, a, of a concentration wave. Again, this, uh, the, the theory behind this um, dates back some years, but uh, it's a very um, effective and economic way of, um, of labeling these sorts of modulations. And there's a nice little um, sort of cartoon to indicate how it works. So this is uh, describing um, a concentration wave for a three component alloy in, in simple terms. So it's the green, red and blue uh, are just indicating the uh, three, three components. So this is suggesting that um, in this alloy, this one dimensional alloy, there, there is a, a modulation which is uh, dividing the system into two sub lattices. And on one sub lattice, the, um, the green atoms preferentially want to occupy. And on the other sub lattice, the, the red atoms want to go. And then the blue ones are still uniformly spread out through, through the system. And so the, the, compass, the concentration wave, so to speak, is then um, mapped out here in, in green for the, for the green atoms uh, out of phase, the red ones, and then a, just a flat a zero modulation for the blue ones. So that's the way we, that we uh, analyze the, the energy costs and label uh, and explore the, the energy profile. So from that, we can um, 
investigate the growth of short range order and then ultimately the long range order that might uh, happen when you call the solid solution. And then we find the mode which becomes unstable first at the highest temperature in which some mode becomes unstable. So um, this is analogous to uh, lattice dynamic uh, um, descriptions of materials when you're looking at the structural instabilities of a material. So if we want to investigate, um, if we're looking at a, a body centered solid solution shown on, on the left here on the, um, in the middle in the middle of the slide, it's the A2 phase, the, the, the body centered uh, cubic solid solution. And if we were to apply a modulation, a concentration wave, which is modulated with a wave vector 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, then we would get this B2 ordered structure. This is um, a cesium chloride uh, ordered structure. So you can see this, again, if you could see there's a map out, um, as it, uh, let's see, it's going along the x-axis, so a 1, 0, 0 modulation. So we have uh, lots of orange atoms on, on, on this layer, then lots of blue on that, and, and so on. So that would be one possible ordered phase that could arise, labelled by this wave vector. And if we uh, if we found that um, a mode which was uh, with a wave vector of a half, half, half in the Bruin zone, this would indicate a B32 uh, phase, which is um, shown schematically uh, on, on the far part of the slide. So from this way, um, and there's a nice uh, classification of all the various ordered phases that can arise. Uh, label them by these uh, particular um, wave vector points in uh, in reciprocal space. Incidentally, if uh, the zero, the, the null result was the favoured mode, this would suggest that at some temperature the alloy is going to phase segregate. Okay, so we've um, run this approach of uh, to keep an eye on the time. I just want to advertise our work. Um, so. Uh, we've run this for a number of systems now. Uh, we started off with the, the famous Cantor Wu alloys uh, back a couple of years ago. And then uh, I'll talk about the refractory uh, alloys just in a minute, assuming my time is not too bad. And then uh, there's some other papers here that were the more, the more recent ones. Okay, so I'm going to discuss um, the, these alloys, which are uh, comprised of uh, niobium and moly and tantalum, and vanadium and tungsten. And so quite a lot of information here, but I'll, I'll just uh, highlight the, the important aspects. So this is a map of the energy cost versus the wave vector of the modulation that we're imposing. And we're just seeing which is the energetically most favorable mode. And you can see for this niobium moly solid solution, if we were to just uh, put in these uh, compositional fluctuations, it's saying that uh, this system would become unstable to a, an ordering which is specified by this wave vector at the H point. This is the 0, 0, 001 um, uh, wave vector. So this suggests that niobium moly will uh, order into a cesium chloride, a B2 phase. And, and we can use this information to determine the transition temperature. Niobium tantalum, nonetheless, however, wants to, it's a both of these have the same number of valence electrons, so they happily mix and they'll stay mixed in a solid solution down to very low temperatures. Vanadium tantalum has a different ordering. Its preferred mode is at the half, half, half point. So this, uh, this predict or, or says that this particular alloy will form a B32 phase. When we go to the higher components, the three, four and five components, again, we have the similar sort of picture. So niobium, molybdenum, and tantalum, this will have some B2, some cesium chloride type ordering at some temperature. Um, and we can do some mode analysis, which I'll show in a minute, to, to show the, the nature of that ordering. Niobium, uh, moly, tantalum, tungsten also has a, a B2 type ordering, and I'll show the analysis of the mode. But when some vanadium is added in, that promotes this B32 order. Okay, so having um, shown the, the, the important modes and what sort of ordering is going to arise in the solid solutions, I can now just show you the results for the, the transition temperatures that um, we estimate for, the, for this ordering. Vanadium tantalum has a fairly highish uh, temperature from which it will order, we say, into this B32 phase. 
likewise the niobium molybdenum uh, into a B2 phase. Uh, niobium tantalum has a very low temperature, showing how they it wants to stay in a solid solution quite to quite low temperatures. And now I'm going to just mention this three component system. So niobium and tantalum, they're isoelectronic, and this is reflected in the mode. So this is saying that there is a B2 a cesium chloride order, but this means that essentially it's, there's two sublattices. One sublattice is um, moly rich and the other one is moly poor. And the niobium and tantalum are, are, are basically um, uh, sticking on the, on the other sublattice. The four component alloy, again, has a similar sort of labeling for its ordering. So some cesium chloride type ordering. But in this case, we have the, um, we have the niobium and tantalum uh, primarily on one sublattice and the moly and tungsten on the other sublattice. And then finally, for the five component system, we have this B32 type ordering where essentially you've got the, the sublattices, two sublattices, uh, is, is vanadium rich and vanadium poor. So it's the vanadium ordering away from the others that's the most dominant. So from, from that information, from that uh, analysis uh, of our DFT-based results, we can then extract out uh, interatomic um, uh, pair, pair interactions to, um, to, to specify a lattice-based model. And then we can um, carry out some Monte Carlo simulations to analyze the, the phase, um, phase stability in further detail. Um, to have the time to go into too much detail here, but here's some just some nice pictures to show what happens as a function of temperature. So if you're interested um, to find more details, which I hope you, you uh, will be, um, along as well as the published papers, um, Springer commissioned uh, Chris to um, uh, prepare a, 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 an extended version of his thesis. Uh, and it's, this has now just been published. So there's plenty more details there. And then finally, just let me um, summarize what I've, um, I've uh, wanted to say today. So I've reported on uh, an approach which is used the well tried, well um, used density functional theory method for describing um, systems in terms of their electrons and nuclei. But we've combined it with this coherent potential approximation approach to uh, describe the disordered multi-component solid solution at a, a rather low computational cost, uh, which is and it's um, uh, reasonably accurate. We then analyze the energy cost of a compositional fluctuation around this description of the high temperature disordered high entropy alloy to pick out the atomic ordering tendencies and also which I haven't had time to give as much more detail on it, but it also gives robust parameters for further atomistic modeling. Um, and to date, we're, we're really pleased with the agreement we get with the experiment. And uh, we reckon we have a predictive tool for materials discovery of, of materials of this type, um, given the relatively low computational costs, so we can, we can explore uh, a large number of systems. So for example, for a modest uh, computational costs these days for high performance computing, we can predict some phase behavior for a range of compositions and temperatures. Um, so some the publication on the refractories is listed here and some further work listed below it. And finally, let me just thank you for listening.